There we go. Recording has begun. Good evening. Uh, so I'm now calling the Tuesday, September 20th, 2022, regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to order. Time is 7.02 p.m. Please note that in accordance with government code section 54953E3, this met meeting is being held by a teleconference only. Because we're video conferencing, we'll follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, presenters, and the public will provide comments. If you called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video conferencing etiquette by muting your line when you're not speaking, uh, as Ms. Vargas has just said, uh, and limit your distracted behavior on camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Okay. Commissioners, I will be conducting all roll calls this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comment or vote. President Spreen. Here. Vice President Sherlock. Commissioner Besiege. Jim. You're muted, Jim. <laughs> Unmute, Jim. <laughs> Here, sorry. Thank you, no problem. Uh, Commissioner Tonka. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Tyson. Here. Commissioner Vaughn. Commissioner Warren. Here. All right, and we have five commissioners present, which is a quorum. Um, for the benefit of the recording, I will also conduct a presenters, consultants, and staff roll call. Fire Chief Kirkow. Good evening, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay. okay. Strategic Planning Consultant Scott. Here. Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council HFR Program Director Brenner Cannon. Here. Thank you. Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council HFR Project Manager Armstrong. Here. Thank you. Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council HFR Project Coordinator Valle. Here. Where's it Valle? Valle or Valle? <laughs> Valle. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, engineering consultant Tarantino. Let's see him. Uh, CERT Supervisor Stewart. Here. Okay. Emergency Services Manager Gluhan. Present. Okay. Programs Planning and Grants Manager Rendler. Eugenia, you might be on mute. I am no, no, present. Please. General Manager Logan. Here. Okay. And Assistant County Council Mitra. Hi there. Presenters, consultants, and staff are accounted for. Great. Thank you. And uh, let's see, we'll move on to item three. Uh, actually, start with my remarks. We, we really have a full agenda tonight as it is a lot of different reports. So I'll save any comments for the various items there, which will let us move directly on to item three, public comment. Persons wishing to address the commission on any subject not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, the commission is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker, unless the number of speakers requires the commission president to impose shorter time limits. I don't think that'll be the case this evening. Do we have any public comment on items not on the agenda? I see one. Hand up, Alan, you have the floor. Thanks very much. I'd just like to ask at a future meeting that you could give an update. Maybe Eaton Associates could come talk about the district's uh, IT plans and the uh, plans to get all the district's records online and searchable by uh, residents. Thanks very much. Great, thank you for that comment. Okay, uh, seeing no other Hands up, we will now move on to item four, the consent calendar and changes to the order of the agenda. Let's see, are there any comments from staff on these items? Oh, okay. Uh, are there any questions from the commission on these items or would any commissioners like to make changes to the consent calendar or the order of the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. Will the commissioner making the motion and the commissioner seconding the motion please state your names for the benefit of the recording. Warren moves to adopt the consent calendar. 
as stated. Second, Commissioner Tanko. Great, thank you. Um, this item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Seeing none, thank you. Is there any public comment on these items? Seeing none, thank you. There's no further discussion. We will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Basigi. Jim, if you can unmute. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner mm. Tyson. Yes. I don't think Melvin's joined. So Commissioner Warren. Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you. We will move on to item five, which is the monthly fire chief reports. Fire Chief Kirkhoff, if you could please provide those reports. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was just trying to uh, share my screen. And um, uh, Corey, can you enable that for me, please? Ah, yes. thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, we continue to um, see just overall in the district, uh, well, excuse me, in the jurisdiction served, that's all the way from Los Altos Hills County Fire District all the way to Los Gatos, a bit of an uptake in call volume. So for August of uh, last year or last month, excuse me, um, there was a couple of vegetation fires, one that was really um, a nothing fire. Uh, it was caused by some electrical uh, uh, that was found near a tree, didn't really go anywhere, didn't really have any place to go. It resulted in $100 worth of uh, dollar loss estimated. This one here was a vegetation fire. It was the only one that the operations division deemed as um, a significant event. Um, it was uh, in uh, due to construction in the area. Uh, no injuries or citizens or emergency respond uh, incidents uh, for emergency responders was noted. Um, again, just going to um, our uh, basically uh, the public safety report here, you're seeing just an uptick here in 2022. Again, this is com comparable to last year and the year before, month to date. Um, again, back before 2020, we were seeing a little bit of an up, uh, upward trend, not by much. Um, and here we're starting to see that. I can tell you from just being out on the roads that traffic is starting to kick back up. So we're seeing a few more vehicle accidents in the district on 280 that we hadn't seen, especially in 2020, 2021. Overall for the month, you had 85 calls. Uh, in the hills, uh, the district, <coughs> excuse me. Um, again, about 60%, as always, is about EMS, with the rest of it kind of falling <clears throat> typically in alignment. Um, you've got, again, a, a place where we do move ups uh, when a unit is out. So, engine 71, <clears throat> as well as engine 77, responded first due to the district. Um, excuse me, I don't have any water here. I'm going to make it very brief here. Uh, with five programs, 62 attendees, here is basically the map of uh, the calls in terms of uh, distribution. Um, and then for Palo Alto Station 8, which was staffed by County Fire last month, um, this month it's staffed by um, Palo, uh, Palo Alto Fire. There were a total of nine responses um, involving the Station 8 crew, four of which were canceled en route. And that usually means somebody else got there before us. It's a dual response. It might've been on the freeway. Um, it looks like here it was on Stirrup Way. Again, another, another rig might've gotten there. First Page Mill, um, looks like a couple on Page Mill and uh, Minalto. So um, for we must in nature, um, there was uh, from what, uh, was reported uh, no um, vegetation fires there that Station 8 responded to. There were vehicle accidents or canceled around for some other thing uh, in which a unit got there uh, prior to the um, uh, staffed uh, Engine 384 at Station 8. Um, with that said, is there any questions for the report that I can answer or try to answer? George, I see your hands up. You know, I'm, I'm, I tried to use the reaction and it says recognize hand gesture, but I don't see anything happening. 
Okay. Well, anyway, so just thanks for that report, you know, specific to station eight. By the way, the other commissioners, I, I did a little hike from my house and went up there back when Palo Alto was um, in uh, monitor, was staffing it, which was uh, the previous month. And it's really quite the location and it's, it's, you can just see the value of having this being staffed this time of year. Um, really nice to meet the uh, firefighters too and tell them uh, how important their work there was. Uh, I'm, I should come back when Santa Clara uh, some county fires there as well. But just, can you remind me how late does the weather in the fall affect when we when we turn this off in terms of our staffing this extra station? And that might yeah. not be a question for you. I don't I don't know. <laughs> so we work very closely with the district. Um, and if there's uh, like for example, this little bit of rain doesn't predicate for us to stop staffing it. It really we we um, usually look to cal fire and when they call and when i say call they basically say fire season officially said it now there's vegetation fires post that time period but the saturation the humidity recovery in the vegetation is such that if there is a, a vegetation fire we feel very confidently we can get it surrounded and contain it pretty rapidly with first two units, units that can get there within five to seven minutes. So um, usually it's the second heavy rain in uh, the, the, if you will, fall months. This one is a bit of a one-off just because um, there was basically a quarter of an inch. We anticipate some more drying uh, just to because we're not out of fire season yet. And then uh, we'll, we'll work closely with communicating with the district when, with our recommendation to stop staffing it. Great. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other uh, comments from the commission? See, I'm not seeing any other hands up, excuse me. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll not take any public comments on these reports. Uh, please know if you, have, if you have any further questions on this or any of the upcoming reports we have this evening, staff will be collecting those questions and they'll have them on the video recording so that we can get answers to those and provide responses either offline or the next meeting. Uh, I see a hand up, Alan. You're, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chief, I've got a couple questions. Uh, my first question relates to the cancellations. You said that uh, they were canceled because another unit got there, but my understanding was that uh, these calls were all in what uh, uh, this district's first service area was. So they, they're, they're the, the station that's responsible uh, for, for being dispatched. Um, secondly, the the last two calls are both on Minolta Drive and they're only three minutes apart. Are, are they actually two separate calls? My third question relates to uh, how many red flag days were there in August and how many days did the department move to a higher mode staffing? And my last question is, is now that station eight is manned, is the department no longer implementing the Los Altos Hills County Fire District extra Pfizer season patrol? Thanks very much. Great. Thank you for those questions. We'll get uh, answers for those for next time we're offline. Okay, uh, let's see. Thank you for those reports. Let's see. Uh, we will now move on to item six. General Manager Logan, please present the General Manager Report. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Board President Spreen. Um, moving right into the General Manager Report, I wanted to go to uh, this slide, which is the update events and activities, because it fits very nicely with what Chief Kirkow just talked about. And that is that we had nine operational area calls to collaborate with partners uh, regarding the very intense heat that just was around the Labor Day weekend. And here I'm sitting today in a, in a kind of a warm jacket, having amazed at how quickly the weather cooled. But I will tell you during those nine days, it was very uh, concerning. It was a critical incident with the heat that occurred. And I just cannot thank the office, the County Office of, of uh, Emergency Management enough for convening these nine calls. We were, uh, and it's, if you see the agencies here, there were 30, there were uh, nine operational calls. There were 48 partner agencies, nine extended Labor Day in, uh, increment incidents, and these calls were all handled through uh, Office of Emergency Management. And um, uh, 15 jurisdictions, we were one of the jurisdictions uh -huh. that were attuned. And you'll see the call objectives, the various items there, and the staff participated in that. So every call that I was on, which was all nine of them, I recall Fire Station 8 being mentioned. 
by Central Fire saying Fire Station 8 is up and running because that protects that very important corridor right there at a very dangerous location if uh, ignitions were to occur. So thank you, Chief Kirkow, and thank you to the county for that amazing um, ability to for all of us to come together on uh, in, in that very, very difficult event. Um, then moving on, the staff uh, attended the hoedown, and there's a photo there. Our CERT trailer, emergency trailer, was there as our volunteers were. Victoria Beebe was there to lead that, that event, very, uh, very successful event. And then there was an emergency drill that Dave Stewart will tell you about, but I just wanted to give the link uh, for that that was published in the town crier. So we got some nice uh, publicity from, from that event. Moving on to the next slide, all of these activities that are going on in the month of October are part of our outreach efforts for the community. And you'll hear about some of these during the various reports uh, this evening. So I'll just move through that. Office of Insurance Commissioner Laura, as you know, the insurance commissioner is trying to get into law that efforts taken to mitigate wildfire will be recognized by the insurance companies to where then homeowners are more likely to have their um, premiums reduced or at least be able to retain their insurance or get insurance. So this is quite a, a, uh, an outline of the various parts of that program. Would really recommend that you read it. Everything's written out in sentences so it reads like a report. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, new health orders are out on COVID-19, relaxing some of the restrictions. And then to mention that in October is um, uh, Shakeout Earthquake Drill Month, October 20th. And so we'll be getting a lot of our social media information out to our residents and the community from the district on uh, the, the great shakeout. And then um, the last slide, I wanna talk about two countywide fire studies, one through LAFCO and President Spreen and I met with the LAFCO fire uh, countywide study consultant and answered a, a series of questions, had an interview with him, and then provided quite a bit of information to the group AP Triton to talk about the efforts of promoting uh, prevention, protection, and building resilient communities and all the programs that the district does to protect its local community. And then the second study is from Matrix, that's the countywide study. Similarly, uh, we provided information to Matrix uh, to update their profile of the district and provided all of that through, um, through our exchange of documents. So the next step for both of these consulting groups will be to summarize their findings and then have public meetings to be held by both of the consultant group groups to get uh, um, resident in input. That's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Oh, I just want to mention here, here's some of the extra additional items on the report. You'll see what a nice job recreation of Town of Los Altos Hills did in publicizing our events that are coming up and the safety programs that we're participating in. So picture says a thousand words. That is the end of my report. Thank you. Very, very nice. Great. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Is there any discussion from the commission on any of these items? Seeing no hands there. Is there any public comment on this item or any of these items? Seeing none. Okay, great. We'll move on to item seven. Strategic Planning Consultant Scott, could you please introduce this report on the development of our successor strategic plan? Sure. Thank you, President Spreen. Good evening, everyone. We have our a uh, report from our ad hoc subcommittee on the successor strategic plan. And the chair of that ad hoc group is Commissioner Mark Warren, and he's prepared to uh, give a presentation and I'll pull up the slides right now. Great, thanks and Marcy. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so commission, uh, what we wanna do tonight is brief you. We met again this, um, in, you know, and since the last meeting at the subcommittee, myself, Commissioner Besiege, Commissioner Sherlock, and we went over, we'll go through the content we went over and revised, you know. And so, you know, once again, re reason for the, you know, report this evening is to provide one, an update of where we are going with the strategic plan. And all we, and second is 
you know, because this is the forum that we can get feedback from the rest of the commissioners on the direction that we're taking. And you know, we make sure that we are aligned with the other members of the commission as we move forward with the you know, developing the next version of our strategic plan. Um, so the first thing that we did when we met earlier um, this month was we went over our strategic alignment of entities. And what that means is, is that you know, the commission doesn't exist in a vacuum and we have multiple partners that we and and different groups that we engage with. And so we wanted to make sure that we identified them. So as we as we build the strategic plan, we need to take the different uh, you know, our partners and how we relate to them into account as we develop the strategic plan and how they, um, you know, are impacted by it and what impact, input we should take from them. Um, we start with our strategic partners and, or excuse me, structural partners. And what we what we mean by that are the uh, the organizations that we have a binding agreement with, a legal um, relationship with. Uh, we are a dependent district of the County of Santa Clara um, of Santa Clara County, you know, as chartered by the Board of Supervisors. You know, we have a um, agreement we have a um, binding agreement with central fire that provides our first of uh, you know world-class uh, fire and ems protection for the residents and for the district and through a series of agreements we have um, agreed you know we are structurally partnered with parissima hills you know there are the hydrants belong to the fire district but the water mains belong to parissima hills water district and so we are in this together with our structural partners and that circle broadens out a little more. We have our other partners that we are very close to that we that we have to work with to get anything done. And those are such things as the town of Los Altos Hills, Mid Penn, which we butt up against on a large portion of our um, boundary, got town of Palo Alto, similar Caltrans for the 280 corridor, um, et cetera. Um, then other individuals or other entities that we work with, vendors, you know, that, that we rely on for providing critical uh, support to the district, uh, both consulting and actual delivery of, you know, such things as chipping um, and getting rid of fuel loading. Um, and then stakeholders, you know, that are that have a vested interest in the district and with the direction it's going. First and foremost are the residents of the district. And so, you know, we wanted to, you know, identify the those entities that are impacted and whose input we want to get, you know, solicit as we develop the strategic plan. Okay, I'm running a little long for tonight's meeting. We'll get, I'll try to speed this up a little bit. Next slide, please. All right, go back one. I'll go back one. The one thing that I wanted to you know, emphasize on this slide is in the middle of this, and I use the term, it's the wing that keeps us all together, is the, the district staff in the middle. Because without them, you know, the, you know, none of this happens. And so um, they're a part of, you know, the input into this process too. So they're in the middle, they hold the, this whole thing together. All right, next slide. Okay, so we, we did a, we went through spent a good chunk of the meeting going through our SWOT analysis. I won't go through it all. You've had a chance to read it, but what we tried to do was identify the strengths of the district and what we have you know in the plus column. And as you can see, it's quite extensive. Um, it's it's long, and we are we are very fortunate in that we have a lot of strengths uh, and a lot of resources to draw upon uh, that makes us a successful organization. So then. Moving on to the uh, weaknesses, we try to identify the challenges that you know that we face as a district. Um, to you know, one is you know to keep the the residents in the district uh, engaged, uh, and to you know have them be proactive partners in the execution of the programs because we can provide the programs to the residents, but if they don't participate, it doesn't happen. Um, there's there's still the structural problem of confusion for many residents between what is the fire district and what is central fire and the difference in terms of how do, what does central how does the district differ from central fire? Um, we have a very limited pool to draw from for the district staff just because of the unique nature of how we are structured and set up at this time um, and you know, in the in the space that we're in, you know, going back to the this, the previous uh, item I mentioned, 
the you know we don't have offer a traditional benefits package and so that limits the pool upon which we can draw um, and then um, the organizational infrastructure um, and lack of it dedicated facilities for the the staff we ask the staff to you know operate you know remotely in a non-traditional business environment and we identify that as probably a weakness moving forward as we want to grow and expand the services um, offered by the district. All right, next slide. Opportunities, you know, I'll, I'll speed up again. You know, nimble, the agile, smart, um, forward thinking staff, the number of things that we've been able to do with the, this organization and move quickly. Um, we have the opportunity to expand our communications and outreach to the um, to the residents and our different partners and do that quickly. We can rev leverage best practices and adopt um, new new modes and um, and sciences. And what I'm, what I'm trying to get out of here is, is that because we're a small organization, yes, we have drawbacks, but, but it also gives us an opportunity. It's easier to turn the, um, the direction of the staff here and pivot in a different direction. Um, we have, um, you know, we have, we have staff, yeah, we, we have the ability to bring in people with specialized skills. Um, we have staff that is constantly growing their skill set and bringing in staff that are, you know, have unique sets of skills for specialty issues and areas that we need, you know, to, um, to increase our skill set and, um, and to flesh out the district um, management staff. Um, <clears throat> And so opportunities move forward, generating plans for the district parcel, how to use that for fire science and disaster use and for the district, uh, looking at the town fire roads potentially in the, you know, that go through the district. How do we survey those, make sure that they are in the best material shape um, for serving their purpose and you know, continue to develop plans working to address the risks in the most vulnerable areas based on um, fire science all right marcy one more let's go and then threats um you know as we're all aware as, as jay um, alluded to you know the the hot dry weather we had and we're continuing to see this drought we're in the third year of drought we don't know how long it will last and it won't be the last drought the district faces um we have you know the continued threat of wildfires you know earthquakes are never going to go away natural disasters uh, and then infrastructure issues such as gas and power failures um so um you know the the problem is is that we do you know one of the the small staff being nimble but also there's the threat is is that when when someone in the staff you know turns over we don't have a large bench bench strength to replace them we um it causes a greater workload for the exit, you know, the remaining staff, and we have to go replace those individuals that we lose. Um, we have threats in that many of our residents, their their properties are up narrow, winding roads that were um, put in long, you know, long before modern um, codes were enforced, and so that create and you know, and then they have large parcels with high fuel loading on those parcels, and that fuel loading continues to increase. Um, which creates a threat to the district. And then there's, you know, the potential, you know, through loss of local control and local government management that could, you know, that could happen. All right, next slide. All right, so we went through the SWOT analysis, which is a key part of building out the strategic plan. And so our next step is uh, we're going to conduct, we're, we're, we're planning on conducting a community survey. And so we want, we, you know, we are going to do public meetings. We're planning on doing public meetings, but to get a broader outreach, we are planning on doing um, a community survey to get their input um, on the direction of the uh, strategic plan and the and what they want to see happen. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that through that our goals are to gather uh, residential data on the knowledge and use of the district programs, and that allow us to better design our outreach and education moving forward. We want to actually look at this and make this part of a regular survey, probably on an annual basis. Use this in a you know, form of baseline and be able to measure change. Make see if our plans are being effective. Are we? You know, what is? You know, we, we survey about brush chipping. Let's say how many of them are aware of it. How many of them use it? We want to see year over year. Are we actually make our are, are, are our programs effective? Um, 
and we want to test our assumptions about the district. We sit here, we talk about the district on a monthly basis or, or the staff a daily basis. But, you know, what, what are the residents? Um, you know, we have a certain assumptions. Are those true with the residents? And this, this input then allows us to adjust our budget allocations because we have such a long lead time for the budgeting process. You know, we're talking about, we're always looking at the budget 18 months because between when we start the budgeting process and the approval through the county for the next fiscal year, you know, we have to have a very long event horizon when we're talking about the budget. So we want to use community input through the survey to help drive those decisions. All right, Marcy, next. All right. <clears throat> so next steps. Um, we're meeting again tomorrow. Um, can't get enough fire commission meetings this week, so we're having another one tomorrow. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to be revising the existing goals and objectives. Um, we're going to discuss stool, uh, tools, uh, process, and timeframes um, you know, for measurement in the, in the st successor strategic plan. And we want to determine the next steps in implementing the residential survey. Okay, that was a mouthful. I know that was a lot to take in. What I want to do is, is to get <clears throat> use this opportunity to get some feedback from my fellow commissioners. Are we, are we moving in the right direction? And what feedback do you have for us? Any comments from Commissioner? Oh, I see Commissioner Tyson. That's right. I couldn't help myself. Um, a really good uh, presentation. And um, I, I love SWOT analyses. And uh, it seems as though you're doing a very thorough kind of job. There, it's what, one thing that struck me was you, you spoke about it. You know, we all have weaknesses. Some of them we try to fix and some of them we sort of try to live with. And I, I would say one of the weaknesses you mentioned was that there's confusion out there about our role and how we who, who we work with. And I, I'm going to say, we're going to always have some of that, okay? <laughs> and, and one of the reasons is it's sort of a strength. You mentioned, uh, no, uh, uh, General Manager Logan mentioned about how the, the town is giving publicity to, to district events. And so I think there might be a little bit of name badging issue because the, we're working with the town in terms of the communications. And so people aren't always exactly clear uh, what's going on. You know, as uh, as mayor this year, I, I've responded to emails, uh, including one irate resident saying, the city council is doing nothing for fire prevention. And I had to write a long letter to say, well, here's what's going on. And it's, it's really quite a bit, but it's not that we're doing, it's not that we're doing nothing. And, and you know, maybe this isn't so funny, but at our city council meeting last week, um, we had a group of residents that was gathering right before the city council to complain about something. Well, guess what? They had the wrong city. Their issue was in Los Altos. And so I'd say, cut yourself a little slack on that. And, um, and the final thing I would say is also from the town that uh, we have done a lot of work with, in terms of short, fast, easy to implement surveys. And so if I can help the district uh, by, by stepping in to say, these are some of the things we've learned. Cause I think everybody knows if there's, 12 people that really care about something we might hear, we're going to hear from those 12 people but is that really a consensus we know it's not how do we really get get the, the a true representative response so that's just some of my feedback thanks george we'll have uh, marcy and, and jay reach out about the tools the town and to the town's experience like to leverage that other commissioner comments i'll take this opportunity to say that uh, first of all i want to say how wonderful it how proactive this is being. This is a great model for how we should address a five-year strategic planning horizon, which is something we haven't done in a while. I think this is just great. I particularly like the SWOT analysis because not only is it a great exercise and you really captured a lot of both the strengths and weaknesses I think people should call out. To me, it's a reminder of we are really unique in this valley at taking some really leading edge, appro lead, leading edge approaches in some things. We're using state-of-the-art technologies and practices for hazardous fuel reduction, for hardening, for evacuation routes, with an incredibly small and dedicated staff. And oh, people yeah. should realize how unique this is. Plus, I certainly say the last three years, we're doing it in a way that really uh, recognizes and collaborates with all our neighbors. Um, so I think you know, that people really should see that analysis and recognize what kind of role we're playing here in the Valley that no one else is doing. So I love pulling that out and seeing what else we can, where that takes us in a go forward kind of way. So I think that that was really valuable for me. Thank you for that. Any other commissioner comments? 
Okay, seeing none. Um, let's see, uh, let's take some any public comment on this report. I see, oh, I see one hand up, Alan, you can make comments. Are you muted? Yes, thank you. Uh, my compliments to, to the to the uh, ad hoc committee. I think you've done an uh, excellent job starting out. Uh, I would like to just uh, reinforce what uh, Mayor Tyson said. I think, at least for the two thirds of the uh, constituents that are in the uh, that are in Los Altos his, Hills, there is confusion at times, um, not just between the fire district and the fire department, but Los Altos Hills and the fire district and the fire department. And at times we have um, standing committees and ad hoc committees that seem in the town that seem to have, uh, overlap or duplicate um, uh, some of the efforts that are that are underway uh, with the district. So um, I think that that should be recognized in, in that weakness analysis. Um, and I compliment you on reaching out to residents. I think it's going to be excellent to get surveys and to have residents have an opportunity to participate and get a broader um, uh, view on what the district does and, and to provide input um, into the programs that the district uh, uh, runs. Um, I think uh, many people have ideas about programs that the district should be running and it isn't running, and this would be their opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, lastly, I just would like to say that uh, I've mentioned on, on occasions in the past that the strategic plan has to move into a tactical plan that has detailed plans, tasks, schedules, department goals, um, you know, uh, key performance indicators and so forth. And I, I just like to reinforce that point that somehow that needs to fit into the overall plan. Thanks so much. Great, thank you very much. Good comments. Any others? Uh, seeing no other hands up, uh, we'll move on to item eight. So uh, thank you, thank you all for that. Thank you for that hoc subcommittee for that ongoing work. Um, item 8A is the CERT report. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce that uh, CERT Supervisor Dave Stewart will be presenting that CERT report this evening. Uh, Mr. Stewart, very pleased to have you here with our thanks for all you do, by the way. Uh, please now present that report. Thank you, Commissioner Spreen. Uh, as he said, I'm Dave Stewart. I'm trying to get the screen shared here. Is it coming up? Yes. Okay, good. No, no. Um, yes, no. Looks like a cert report to me. Okay, good. Um, let's go to uh, expand window to fit. All right, we'll just go from here. Um, so this is just a brief report on what's been going on in the cert in the last month. Uh, importantly, we had our summer drill. This is the first major drill we've had in quite a few years due to COVID. Uh, on August 27th, we got about 23, 24, 25 uh, certs and various uh, uh, staff members. Uh, and I think Roger was there, commissioner, uh, at the ARC, which is our uh, uh, supply trailer uh, at Foothill College. The drill ran from 9 until noon, uh, setting up the ARC at 10 a.m., which is really setting up all the infrastructure for uh, managing an event. Ran the drill from 9 to 11.30, followed up with a uh, hot wash. The jargon here is a immediately after the fact uh, discussion of what went well and what went wrong. Uh, we actually got quite a few things done that we wanted to get done. Uh, we had two recon teams actually out on the road looking at critical infrastructure. And the value for that really is to make sure that the radios and the uh, reporting back were working. We also had a uh, team that was not on the road that was basically feeding in a bunch of inserted incidents to help drive the drill. Um, once it comes in through the recon uh, table, uh, we create an incident report. That incident report is copied over to the planning and the operations units. And then uh, they begin to 
work together to create uh, task forms and prioritize what we're doing. The idea here is that we get uh, one incident that is uh, kitty cat is up a tree and another one is a major fire south of town. We need to figure out how and what we're going to respond to. And then the other thing that we did in this drill was we had a uh, uh, town uh, communications person, Andy Kirk, volunteered for this. And it was about reporting back uh, our incidents to the town. So it was fictional, but it actually represented uh, sending data back through the town. Um, Victoria has been doing a lot of work to get the ARC organized, and it's been, it was much easier to get everything out and to get it put away at the end. Um, one of the things that happens when you do these drills all the time is you realize that there are things you can do better. And this time what we discovered was that our incident reporting structure needs some work. Uh, we were basically asking a bunch of questions when what we should be doing is to train the recon people to fill out the forms completely and to um, drive them in. Uh, operations and planning are now separated by a big brown wall uh, because of the new ARC location, and we have difficulty getting them to coordinate and track and maintain their records on uh, priorities. Uh, in general, this is why you do the drills. A, you practice those kinds of information flow, and B, you start to think about how we can make this better. One of the difficulty of doing these drills once every so often is that you don't get uh, what you get in a regular work environment of day-to-day -day tuning and uh, uh, observational fixing of how things work. So we do this once every few years with a bunch of volunteers who have never seen it before, and you always kind of stumble across this stuff. So one of the things that we're moving to now is to have a bunch of ad hoc committees to actually focus on some of the issues that we had going forward. Um, and then finally, there's some of the uh, equipment got moved to the Heritage House, and we need to think about bringing that back. Uh, a couple of pictures here. The one on the right is uh, our recon communication station table with three people to communicate out to the uh, recon groups that are out in the field. And then the planning board, uh, you can see, is very rudimentary. It's a whiteboard with uh, uh, lists on it. We're trying to figure out how to improve that with uh, a bunch of different easy to move and not so much erasing uh, structure. Uh, so, one of the things that we're trying to work on is to get to our out-of-touch certs, refresh, and bring those in for uh, smoother flow. Uh, I think this is mostly just more practice as we um, get, I was going to say out, but we reduce the amount of COVID preparation we need to deal with. Um, one of the things that we really want to do is to engage the town staff in these trainings. Uh, we've had some response from the staff that they'd be interested in doing that. But I'd like to do a full uh, a full end-to-end -end drill where we actually report up to staff, staff sees some of these things and begins to uh, figure out how they're going to work through the same sort of prioritization that we would do. One of the things that is true in CERT is that there are a bunch of incidents that we are likely to report but not be able to handle. If it's a major fire or even a minor fire, you know, our uh, abilities are sort of limited to evacuation and stretching caution tape out. We're not going to go in and fire a building fire. Um, so how we actually communicate that out to responsible authorities and to have them respond back to us is a sort of weak spot that we need to improve on. Um, and basically the other thing is just this whole duties and responsibilities within the roles at the ARC need to be practiced. Uh, practice, I think, is really what has to happen here for all of this. Um, and as usual, we discover that some of our supplies have dried out, gone obsolete, and we need to move forward with those. That's the end of the CERT report. I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, actually, I'm going to add a couple of comments. I, uh, I was pleased to attend and uh, first of all, I just want to say it's wonderful to see the continued energy that our CERT program puts out. Uh, it's great to see that. And really, not enough can be said 
about Dave and Victoria Beebe for really running this program and making it what it is. They deserve all our thanks. And every sir who shows up is so inspiringly interested in helping the town. The other thing I'll say is how effective this drill was in my eyes. Um, when you see group come together, everyone's there to do the right thing and help, but you realize how much work it takes to coordinate that and make it be something effective. So it really, I was inspired to want, you know, what can we do to improve it? Let's do it again. It, it makes you want to really get this process right because you realize how important it's going to be in the case of any kind of emergency. And I'm, in my mind, it really flashes back to earthquake days. So um, it was really something for me to see this program and this drill run. And I really want to thank Dave and, and Victoria for all the energy it took to, to put it together. Any other comments from the uh, commission on the CERT activity? Uh, Commissioner Tonka? Uh, first of all, thank you, Dave, for the incredible work that you're doing. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm sure you've done a few drills in the past. What are the learnings that have come out of the practice drills that you've done? One that is a constant is that more drills would be better, more practice on um, information flow. We always bottleneck with either getting information to the ARC over the recon team or processing it and understanding what sorts of things we need to do. It's kind of a fog of war problem where you're getting incident reports which allegedly are telling you what's going on around town. And then the, the operations management needs to figure out what, um, what priority to assign these and which ones we can and can't deal with. As I was saying about you know major house fires, we need to call somebody else, but then the tracking to understand whether they've been called, uh, that sort of uh, follow-up, all, all just needs to be practiced. So I think that's kind of the, the core learning with every one of these drills. Um, there are some infrastructure issues that I'll get to a little bit later, but I think communication around town is one of the diff other difficulties. We have essentially one voice channel that's open and shared between the town, the ARC, and all of our first responders, volunteer first responders, which is our ham radio repeater. And I'd like to see us figure out how to improve that communication scheme so that there are multiple channels, uh, either voice or better yet would be any sort of modern uh, smartphone operated re recording system. But pushing all that stuff through is, is difficult and making it reliable, particularly in the face of an earthquake is uh, uh, challenging. Great. Great, Dave, Great. thank you for the question. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, great, thank you. We will move on. Item 8B1 is the mid-year report on the defensible space brush chipping and debris removal program. General are, Manager Logan. Are we going to uh, do the Starling yeah. presentation? Yeah, Roger, you, you skipped oh. over oh, I'm eight. sorry, I'm sorry, Starling, please. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, item uh, 8A2 is the Starling presentation for installation at the ARC emergency container. Also, Dave, thank you. And you may have noticed I uh, did a little lead into this. So one of the communication issues that we've had regularly is that trying to communicate um, incident reports across, particularly between the ARC and town uh, is difficult in that it's a single voice channel, it's public, so you need to be careful about what you can and can't say on it. Uh, and the overall bandwidth of the spoken word is no better than a telephone call. So if I start to tell you about a um, some incident in town, we sort of think it's about two or three minutes to transmit a single page of information. You contrast this with what you can do on your smartphone uh, with email, and it's just sort of ridiculous that we're still working at that level except that it's very difficult to have a reliable system. Uh, we've been working at getting internet out to the ARC for some period of time, but even that has been dependent on um, Comcast staying up. And you know, on a sunny day, I don't always get Comcast to work reliably for me. So 
uh, one of the things that I'm proposing here is that Starlink uh, is a low Earth orbiting satellite communication system. Um, it lets us use the internet in ways that are not um, dependent on hardly any terrestrial infrastructure. If Comcast is down, if fiji and &E is down, if the phone systems are down, if the cell towers have all burned up, the stuff should still work, okay? Uh, so I don't wanna read all of this, but let me kind of touch the high points. Um, the amateur radio has its issues, and uh, this is a new system that's available, not too expensive, uh, and by using low Earth orbiting satellites, they actually steer to find these things so that even if the uh, dish is moved by the earthquake, it will still uh, connect up. Um, okay, so I jumped ahead. Satellite communication is not dependent on any of the local infrastructure. Uh, this is high bandwidth enough that it will let us use the web, uh, use mapping, use voice over IP telephones. Uh, and anything else that we need to download from the cloud. Uh, the other thing is that we can test this constantly. We can just make sure it's up all the time by setting up some scripts that will ping and make sure that it's working. Um, and one of the other things is that uh, we need to work with Eaton to understand exactly what their new plan is for the town's emergency operations center. But uh, if the town were to get one of these, we would also have uninterruptible communication between us and the town. Uh, this is basically the Starlink advertisement. Uh, the picture here, the, the little white square on the uh, rectangle on the lower right is the, uh, think of it as a cable modem, except it's your, now your satellite modem. And it has a Wi-Fi connection out that would cover the parking lot around the arc. So that gives you a size uh, that the dish is roughly 18 inches. It will self steer to follow the um, satellites as they pass overhead. We have evaluated this in that uh, Neil Caton purchased one for himself. We took it over to the ARC and in about 20 minutes, we got it up and running. That's the level of uh, preparation it takes to get the thing up and going. The rest of this is the advertising. It's designed to handle a wide range of temperatures. Uh, we were proposing that we would actually mount this on the ARC, or we could just pull it out when it's in use and put it uh, on the stand, which is what it comes with. There's sort of a, how concerned are we with theft to whether we put it up versus, um, uh, put it up on the ARC versus just putting it up in the parking lot when we need it. Uh, the other thing that we've discussed is once we get the connection between the ARC and the fire station, uh, we could move this to the fire station and share it with the fire station perhaps. Uh, everybody wants to know what it's gonna cost. So here's the answer. Uh, first month will cost about $750. After that, it's $110, but there are no contracts. There's a 30 day evaluation. And if you decide that we don't like it, uh, we just ship it back and we get a refund on the equipment. As I said, it took us 20 minutes to set it up the first time. And that's the end. I would hope that um, the commission would decide that this is a good thing and fund this for the CERT program. Thank you, Dave. Any, any comments from the commission? Looking for hands there. Also, a comment. Uh, actually, I appreciate your report answered my questions. And I, I had a weather question. It seems to be pretty robust for that. And I will say, my one, um, my concern. I, I've been to two of these all up cert drills, and both times my question has been, when infrastructure is really down, how are we going to communicate? And you know, will ham be enough? Uh, so I'm actually pleased to get something that really goes beyond our local infrastructure, which could be in any state of disarray. Right. Um, so now granted, this probably changes a lot of the structure of our communication into for, you know, web forms and other forms of uh, data sharing and, uh, and publication, which will take some more discussion. But I think it's the right direction for us to be going. Yeah, Especially I, if I would describe it as enabling. 
Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, please. So, no, no, it, it, it enables a whole computerized structure um, in a way that we actually had running at one point in the distant past. When the ARC was in its former location, we had a uh, connection up to the internet out at the ARC. And in one of the drills, uh, I think we were basically taking all the incident reports, putting them on a flatbed scanner and emailing them to town. And we could do, I think we did about 25 incident reports. We did all the incident reports that came in during a two hour drill. And uh, our biggest delay was in actually getting the equipment set up. But the actual, you know, scan it, add it to an email, mail it to town really quick. I know this is, this is an item for direction only. We're not making any choices, decisions this evening. I'm certainly uh, supportive in this direction. Any other comments from the commissioners in terms of uh, this as a direction for CERT, either to implement or experiment or any comments for or against? I see a thumbs up. So that there's, I see. Uh, Quite a few thumbs up, so let's take that <laughs> as direction to uh, proceed and uh, take us to the next step. I see Jim has a question. Yeah, I was just going to ask a uh, probably a redundant question. Dave, do you see any downside to this in any way, shape, or form? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Yes. Is there a downside? Yes. Yeah, downside is any negative associated because it sounds like it's nirvana. It's almost everything is right with it. Yeah, I. I can't think of a significant downside other than that this is an Elon Musk company and I'm sort of concerned about how long it's going to survive or whether they're going to raise the rate or start doing data caps. But, um, you know, the, the flip side is that it doesn't have a contract. If we decide we don't like it, we can always turn off the month to month and uh, sell the equipment. And Dave, is there any power requirements for us to have out there? It goes along with whatever generation we have in case it, of power range? It does require uh, 120 volt AC power, but we currently have, uh, in fact, we just purchased, the district just purchased a new generator, a dual fuel generator, so we can run on either propane or gasoline. Great. Well, good. Well, I believe you certainly, any uh, public comment on this item? Seeing that, I think I think you've seen uh, some positive direction from uh, from staff, and uh, to proceed along those lines. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Okay, now we'll be moving on to item eight B one, which is the meet your report on the defensible space brush chipping and debris removal program. General Manager Logan, please provide that report. Oh, you're, mute, you're muted, Jay. Jay, I think you're still muted. I had to find my microphone, sorry. <laughs> it got lost in all the layers. Would you like me to do the share screen or? No, I think I've got it now. Do I, is it, is it showing? Uh, we see your beautiful face. Okay. Anything now? Nope, we've had it before, but it went away. And so we're back to just to you. Well, okay, let me try. It seems like I'm struggling to connect to audio, but you can hear my audio, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me start over again, Corey, and then I'll give it over to you. But no, I don't see my program now. Um, Corey, can you please take care of me? There you go. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Spreen. And uh, tonight I'll be presenting the report with uh, Fire Safe Council team. And I'd like to introduce the team, the um, HR, HFR Program Director, Amanda Brenner Cannon, the Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council HFR Project Manager, Irene Armstrong, 
and HFR project coordinator, uh, Nestor Valley, and um, also finance consultant, Corey Vargas. So what I'll do is I'll present the first slides one through four and then turn it over to Fire Safe Council for slides five and six. And we'll just kind of alternate back and forth. You'll see here some nice depictions of brush at the side of the road. And this is what the whole defensible space brush chipping program is all about, is ridding fire fuels in the, in the uh, manner of brush from these acre parcels that are in the, the, the district. And Corey, I don't, seems like I can't, okay. Uh, the report purpose is more of a yes we can kind of report. We'll talk about the program background, the deliveries, the management uh, system by Fire Safe Council, operations by Fire Safe Council, and then the delivery enhancements that we've made in the last couple of months, and the program observations, financial operations summary, and additional changes uh, for continued program improvement. So that's the purpose of this report. It's a pretty encompassing report, and I hope you find it helpful. Next slide. What is a defensible space brush chipping and debris removal program? So it's a monthly program, and it goes back and was founded by the district back in 1998. It's what we consider one of our premier district programs because it provides very high quality, high touch, yes, we can service to the resident. And that's all done through the perspective of the better we can motivate residents to take care of their own parcels, to do property hygiene, and to make part of that property hygiene, ridding the fire fuels and brush to the side of the road, then that is what we consider a high quality yes we can program. The main goal is to remove as much hazardous vegetation as possible, increase neighbor and property resiliency by promoting property hygiene, and involve the residents for the management of their own brush and tree limbs on their property to create this defensible space around their homes at, at any time of the year. And that's really what I call a quid pro quo program. In other words, we say to residents, if you will take your time and your energy and your labor and perhaps your dollars that you pay your landscaper or your gardener and you, you harvest all of this brush, put it at the side of the road, we'll send our chipper truck out, we will chip it, and then we will either put it back in a form that's not hazardous or we will haul it away. And that's the quid pro quo program. Next slide. The chipping program delivery uh, traditionally is you'll see the, the map of the district with the six areas. So that means that each one of the residents lives in one of these areas. And since there's six and there's 12 months, each year they get two months of service where they can count on the chipping service coming to their area. And so that's called the six program areas. Um, residents are familiar with this traditional twice a year chipping schedule. And so from a staff perspective, we've not been willing to change that because once the resident is aware of it, they embrace it, they like it, it's traditional. In other words, don't mess with success. So residents are re regularly scheduled. They receive their packets by US mail, uh, whichever area is in the queue. And then they also can send back the registration in the mail or they can register online. And I've got to take a little, little sidestep here because when I came into the district, which was will be four years now in October, literally the chipping program was done by one contractor. The records were kept on index cards. The district did not see the index cards, and that's how the chipping program ran. Imagine four years later, we've used all the technology advances available to us. We have software programs, and we regulate it and manage it all through software and through a, a bidding process. So we get the best of the bidding results in the marketplace by contractors bidding. All of that takes a tremendous amount of staff time, takes planning, organization, and it also takes change without disrupting the customer delight, which we find occurs with the chipping program. So additionally, we accommodate on-call chipping. In other words, we don't say no, we say, yes, we can. So someone says, a tree just fell. I had my gardener, they, they, they branched it up. Can a chipper stop by and take care of it? We say, well, we're in area six, you're in area three, but yes, we can. We'll come by and we'll pick up that, 
that uh, those limbs, if they meet our qualifications and we'll chip it. So the district is charged a rate per on-call property and a rate per cubic yard of brush chipped for these properties. That's effective July, 2022. We had to change the metrics of our program to where the contractor then would be willing to do the on-call. So we have traditional chipping and we have on-call. And next slide, please. Is this still my slide, Corey? Is this slide four? This no. is slide five. <laughs> okay, so this is slide five. So um, Amanda, Irene, Nestor, who would like to take this from Fire Safe Council to talk about what you do to manage the program as our partner in Tripping? I believe Irene has this. Great, Thanks, thank you, Amanda. I'll be presenting for the Fire Safe Council. <laughs> oh, thank you. And Irene is our boots on the ground. She is fantastic, takes care of the chipping along with Nestor, and is also our boots on the ground for our evacuation routes. So um, I'm sure you've seen Irene and her smiling face, and she knows more about this community probably than any one resident around. So Irene, it's all yours with that introduction. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. So yes, I'm Irene. I'm the project manager for the chipping program. I work very closely with Nestor, who's project coordinator on the program as well. Um, so I'll be discussing the program management. Um, the Fire Safe Council manages the chipping program through coordinating chipping events with the use of Fireside, which is the Chipper Day program. Um, it helps us manage the registration, the contractor routes, the chipping metrics, and automated customer communications. Another area of the program management that the Fire Safe Council provides is an availability to the chipping contractors before the event, during the event, and after the event. We prepare uh, requests for proposals each, each month, bidding qualification discussions and clarifications. And then in the field, we're there for pile measurement and photo documentation um, accuracy. And then we also review contractor invoices and collect those into invoice packages and operational reports. A large part of the management is the communication to accommodate schedules or changes with the understanding that there are limitations, but when there are requests, we try our best to accommodate them because the goal of the program is to get the fuel off the ground. Um, next slide, please. Um, so going into some of the daily program operations. So we have, there's two of us dedicated to the program in Los Altos Hills, Nestor and I. Um, one of us is at least out there with the contractor each day in the field during our events. Um, and so some of the daily program operations include finalizing daily work plans, ensuring accurate metrics collected in the fireside application and then for general iPad support, um, making sure instructions and registration notes provided by the resident are being followed. Areas are left clean, ongoing communication throughout the event for specific requests and returning calls that come through throughout the weeks. Um, and then we reach out to piles that couldn't be found for extra guidance. Um, and then lastly, we provide an end of the report to the contractors for billing. End of my slide. Okay. And so this is one of our new delivery enhancements for the chipping program. And this started in January of, of 2022. And the district added extra out of area service to the monthly bus brush chipping program. These extra services are for customers who do not live in the regularly scheduled program area, but who have large piles of brush for removal. And the, and the qualification there is the piles should be larger than what would fit into four green bins. So in other words, it's not an organic pickup. It is truly a brush um, hazard removal uh, pickup. And what we were able to do with Fire Aside, which is the uh, software program, is we knew where the trucks were going to go and what their routing would be. And we found we could pretty efficiently accommodate the whole district and do this extra chipping on call uh, to, to those customers for these large piles. Because what we didn't want is the large piles sitting on the property or not being harvested or the resident just waiting for their next six month time, they would be able to have the chipping. So the residents who are out of the area receive again, US mail postcard each month informing them that this is a new service opportunity to, to rid their property of large quantities of brush as it accumulates. Residents who wish to participate register online, the same as residents who live within the traditional scheduled program areas, or they can call the district and 
for, a, for email registration card. Extra service is provided during the same two week period of chipping and the district does not limit the numbers of times a resident may use the extra service. Because again, our goal is to remove large quantities of brush. So you see one of our um, flyers here, uh, postcards that we send out every month to residents informing them, again, this is your time to prepare your home for wildfire. Wildfire never sleeps. And you know, please uh, avail yourself to this if you have large piles of brush. Next slide. So here's our 2022 program observations. During January through June, we had an increase of 50% of registrants using the extra service. To us, that was a significant measurement that said we were meeting a need in our community. And it, so it's very, uh, very helpful that we've added this extra service. We had a 25% increase in program participation as compared to the first half of 2021. In April, the bidding was used, uh, bidding process used an estimate of 30 cubic yards of brush per household to give contractors a more accurate depiction of how much brush to expect. And the value was based on 21 metrics. And now you're going to see an interesting um, set of metrics, and that is current volume of brush per resident is 39 cubic yards over Q1 and 2. But then there's a big jump of 17 cubic yards of residents in Q1 with an average of 50 cubic yards of residents in Q2. So what that says told us is no matter how we sort the cards in cubic yards, it varies, it's random, it's not predictable. That has an impact on our program and the way in which we try to anticipate program needs. So the volume of brush per household is difficult to predict. It may be due to vegetation growth throughout the year, repeat customers, Situational awareness, we really found when we have incidences, that's when residents start doing more of their brush hygiene management or the upcoming fire season or others. We, we've not been able to find that predictor. So as a result, we revised the bidding and billing process as, as of July, 2022, has to make verification of charges easier and to be more transparent while keeping bids competitive and maintaining the yes we can services to residents as the primary focus to encourage residents to reduce hazardous brush on their properties. So with all that said, I'm going to turn it over to Corey Vargas, our financial consultant, and she's going to take us through the numbers. So how does this look number wise? Yeah, okay, so number wise, um, so slides nine or yeah, slides nine and 10, they both have, uh, the same data, uh, but slide nine is the uh, line item breakdown. Slide 10 is just a quick summary of the same numbers. So I'm just gonna focus on slide nine for now. Um, and we have um, the different uh, breakdown of, of costs. Um, so up at the top, um, we have our uh, Fire Safe Council payroll and administrative costs. Um, and as was discussed earlier by Irene, um, it's a two person team that's uh, dedicated to the shipping program and she went over all those numerous duties that they do um, to run the program daily oversight of chipping communication with the residents uh, coordination with the district coordination with uh, the fire aside software um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that was at a cost of uh, 47,643. Uh, it's about 21% of the uh, total program cost. And I um, wanted to also note that their uh, payroll doesn't have an uplift cost. It's the fully, fully burdened rate that uh, we pay on that. Um, then we have the contractor costs. So this is the actual chipping contractor costs for the six month period. Um, the contractor that goes out, out there and does the ship chipping, uh, 151, 597. And then a fireside are the one, the software that runs the program, uh, that's 6,730. Um, and then there is a contractor uplift charge uh, cost of 12% um, that is paid to uh, Fire Safe Council. Um, so total contractor costs 177,326, which is about 78% of the total program costs. Uh, other costs include the uh, mileage for the employees uh, when they travel with the chippers uh, during the program run. Um, and then uh, materials such as the iPad service line uh, for the chippers to record when they have um, completed the, the 
<laughs> excuse me, <laughs> completed the, the chipping. Um, and those other costs, uh, there's also an uplift cost. Uh, those total costs, uh, 1,720, um, but just a fraction of the total costs. So um, our total vendor costs for the program, January through June, 226, 689. And uh, that does not include the uh, costs for the mailers that go out to the residents as an additional cost. This is just the, the actual implementation costs um, to get the chipping done. So I'm gonna skip that because that was just a summary. Um, now here's a breakdown, Q1 and Q2. And as Jay had mentioned, um, you know, it's very difficult to uh, predict the total volume of brush per household, because as you can see, um, if you look in the total cubic yards of brush chipped month by month, it varies so greatly. Um, and the average uh, will vary so greatly. January, it was you know, 16 cubic yards per resident. June was 72 cubic yards for residents. So it's um, very hard to predict uh, the volume. Um, and we have, um, so this chart, I, I think, uh, again, shows, uh, as we said, there was an uptick. Um, now June looks a little bit lower, but I believe it was uh, August. That, I know we talked about that earlier today, Irene. <laughs> it was July or August. One of those two was, was a lot higher. One of them was a lot lower. So it 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 again. It's it's uh, unpredictable. Um, but I want to focus that uh, the average vendor cost per cubic yard of brush fifteen dollars and fifty one cents per resident. And down to the next. And this is um, to kind of give you a visual of how much brush has been removed. Uh, 14,614 cubic yards of hazardous brush removed uh, tree limbs branches from the uh, 465 uh, residential properties served during the first half of 2022. That's going to fill up 910 dump trucks. So um, very impressive. We're not talking Tonka trucks here either, even though that's what the picture looks like. This <laughs> real, uh, real live uh, dump trucks. So um, yeah. I think uh, we'll move on then to back to uh, Irene. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna go over the revised bidding and billing process. Um, so during this process, we wanted to maintain our relationship with our current contractors, but we also wanted to attract new contractors to bid for the program as well. Um, this keeps the bidding process competitive, and I really want to emphasize that a competitive bid process is important for the value of the taxpayer's money. It's important for the contractors involved, and it's also important for the overall chipping program. Um, these new bidding and billing components include a rate per cubic yard of brush chipped, daily service rate, estimated hauling fees, and a rate per cubic yard of brush chipped and rate per property for on-call service requests. Um, I also wanted to highlight that Nestor conducted multiple meetings with shipping contractors to see if this updated process is something they could provide to us. And so far they have, and there has been recently an uptick in contractor participation. So our efforts are hopefully being rewarded. <laughs> and to finalize my slide here, I wanted to just note that these changes didn't take effect until July of 2022. So the numbers on the previous slides aren't impacted by these changes quite yet. Um, so, um, and I also wanted to allow any of the other Fire Safe Council personnel to include any comments here. Um, otherwise, that's the end of Fire Safe Council report during the slideshow. Nothing from me. Thank you, everybody. I have nothing to add either. Thank you, Irene. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irene. Okay, to summarize uh, the, the purpose of this report, and I think we ticked off all of these uh, objectives, was to provide program background, the delivery system, the overall management by Fire Safe Council, give you a flavor for daily operations and the crew that does those daily operations out in, in your community. The uh, 2022 program delivery enhancements, the new pieces we've added to the program, and then program observations, kind of lessons learned, the financial and operational summaries, uh, which uh, I think were very helpful. And I, I thank Corey and our special consultant uh, contractor, uh, Sarah Hendricks, for putting those together. 
And uh, we're looking forward to additional changes and continued program improvement. This is going to be one of those continuous improvement cycles so we can keep our customer delight. Yes, we can. And most importantly, ridding the hills of fire fuel. And I do have to say, we debated a little bit if we use the Tonka toy truck or we use another metrics. But Sarah won that argument and she got to use the Tonka toy truck. And she said she chose the biggest dump truck for the uh, volume of numbers of, of, of dump trucks. However, she did put it in a perspective that I'd like to share with you. She said, if you took a football field, you filled the football field completely with um, brush, it would go up to the crossbars of the goalpost. That's wow. what equals that, uh, that Tonka truck kind of uh, metrics that we gave you. She didn't want to reveal that, and so she's probably going to be annoyed with me when she listens to this uh, transcript because she wanted it to get to the top of the goalpost, which has probably already happened uh, from what we've seen in the last couple of months. But but that's the kind of picture that we can give you, that that's the kind of, of, of volume of brush that we're taking out of hazardous biofuels. And that's around the main structures. So this is defensible space brush chipping. It's getting the brush away from the structures. So when fires come through, we're going to be a more resilient community and the residents, the residents are going to be better protected. And if we protect the resident, we protect the neighborhood that protects the community. So uh, with that remarks, if there's any other remarks, Amanda, um, I kind of wanted to see if you could give some remarks because you've been in a number of brush chipping programs and maybe just your perspective as a newcomer to this um, event that we have in Los Altos. Can I ask you to talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. So all chipping programs I've been involved or really uh, either been involved with or have seen are very different. Of course, it depends on the community. All communities are different for programs, contractors, residents, um, and the needs of those residents. So I've been with the Fire Safe Council now for four weeks. <laughs> but even then, from what I've experienced in my short time, um, is that the chipper program is well coordinated. It is set up to serve the community on a large scale and on a consistent and annual basis. So the different areas, you know, two months, all of that. Um, and vegetation management is something that happens every year and chipping is necessary, necessary to remove that buildup. So, um, you know, as things grow in the residents, so you know, chipping programs are really uh, necessary. And that that model of consistency and really serving residents um, is something that kind of rang as uh, a really important um, method or way of moving forward with this chipper program. Um, so also the use of technology to increase capacity and the efficiency um, is something that I've not used before. Uh, mm -hmm. And I look forward to learning more about the chipper day program. Um, so I think that's really cool and unique from other chipper programs that I've been involved with. Um, and the bidding process that the crew has been working on uh, looks to be competitive and transparent. Um, and that's something, uh, definitely a model that I have not seen before. Um, and finally, just one last comment is the yes, we can model. It does take more, but it's this kind of model that can elevate programs like this and work to remove that much more fuel. Um, and I've not seen this, uh, I have not seen this approach in, in other programs, not to this level. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you, Jay. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. And welcome to Fire Safe Council and to helping us out with all of our exciting programs. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, thank that's you. the report, President Spring. And, and then certainly you'd want to now take it back to the commission. Question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Manager Logan, and all the Fire Safe Council representatives here. We appreciate your presence here. Uh, I see a couple of comments from commissioners. Let's start with Jim. Yes, I like to speak to a defensible space brush chipping program from a personal, as a resident's personal point of view. Uh, we had our property uh, inspected twice uh, by, fire, by uh, fire Safe Council uh, member and uh, and both time there were significant amount of suggestion came out that basically enabled us to create a, a very significant um, uh, defensible space around our property, including removal of all the low brushes, low, low bushes that are right around the, uh, the building, 
cutting a lot of the branches, low branches, all, even medium branches, and and trimming out the, the trees so that they don't the, the branches don't intertwine and all of that. And we created an amazing amount of cutting out of all this uh, to the tune of like I'm sorry to say that you know throw a number out. It was like 10, 10 grand worth of money, but which is to, to our way of thinking it was well worth spending because we are now could could be feeling a little more safe. So pile all that up in the front and they came over and took it all over and it just, this was really an extremely satisfying uh, uh, experience for us. The second um, uh, observation I'd like to make is that I'm a hiker and I walk up and down and, you know, hike all over the place. There's a, there's a, a lane called the uh, Three Forks Lane in, in Lower Page Mill. Lower Page Mill, as you may know, is highly, highly heavily wooded and a lot of brushes of all different heights and, you know, uh, all over the place. And this particular uh, lane is extremely heavily wooded. As you, when you're walking through it, you feel like you're in, a, in miles away in the, in the uh, essential wilderness. It's uh, very heavily wooded. And uh, some, sometime about two years ago, the, the residents decided to get together and do a significant amount of trimming. I don't know if it was better as the instigation of the uh, Fire Safe Council or how, they, how it all happened. But as I was walking through multiple weeks after weeks, I noticed incredible amount of vegetation and cutting was piled all through the Three Forks Lane and then extending out to Page Mill Road and Via Feliz next door. So, and over time, all of this was removed. I was absolutely gobsmacked by how much material was removed from that area. So with those, I, I really believe that um, the Defense for the Space Shipping program is really working, and I'd like to see more residents of the town take advantage of it. Um, but uh, that being said, I think I'm, I'm beginning to see, based on even some of the data that you showed, that uh, the numbers are growing over time, uh, even though they are, they're a little bit random, but, uh, but the trend line it seems to be to the right and up. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. It's, this is a really a wonderful program. Thank you for those words, com uh, comments, uh, Commissioner Basiji. Mark, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, first comment about how this program has evolved over time, as, as Jay, as General Manager Logan, you know, talked about how I think it's so important how this the staff has responded. Is you know, several years ago, it was you know being run in a pretty antiquated manner, and we have brought it forward, you know, in a use of modern. You know, management te you know, techniques and the ability that residents now have to reach out to the district, receive this service on a, you know, uh, pretty, we can respond fairly quickly to the residents needs. Um, and I think that that speaks volumes to what the staff has done. I think it's really important. I think it's also, you know, shows how important this program is for the district because, you know, for public safety, removing the fuel from the district is you know paramount you know to increasing public safety um, and especially in fire season and this program's quid pro quo with the the residents where we it's really you know meet you halfway the, the residents do all the trimming hauling get it to stacked and you know you know to the roadside for pickup and we bring the trucks by and make that fuel go away it's really a partnership with the residents and I think that's really important. It keeps the residents involved. It keeps them, you know, it brings them out you know, um, to do the defensible space surveys and we get that fuel out of the, you know, the district. And so all around, um, I think this is just, you know, a very important project. And I like to see, you know, I'm really impressed with the, the thoroughness of the report and the data that was provided. So let's finish filling that football field. You know, let's double <laughs> that or triple that. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Warren. Commissioner Tonka. I just want to echo what's already been said in terms of the fact that uh, this program is a huge asset to our town and for many years our residents have been struggling with what to do with the brush that surrounds their home. In fact, I just heard from a resident the other day that their homeowner's insurance was canceled because uh, of a fire risk and they were told that anything within 10 feet of their home would require to go. To go. So now even the insurance companies are picking up on the on the increased fire risk that is posed to our town through you know, trees and brush and uh, anything that comes within 10 feet of our, of our homes. So something that to be aware of. Wow, yikes. 
because um, I definitely have a few things left that are still that close. Uh, I've used this program twice myself, personally spending my time dragging brush out to the uh, side of the road. So I'm, I'm a happy participant myself. Moving on to public comments, I see we have uh, Dave Stewart has his hand up. Thank you, Commissioner Spring. Yeah, I'm also a repeat customer uh, on this program. And I think it's a great program for all the reasons that have been mentioned. I don't need to repeat those. Um, when I do my own yard maintenance, because I'm basically lazy, I can fill one green bin and that's just about it. I think that's completely adequate for normal circumstances. Um, where I really use this program is when I have uh, gardeners, landscape people come in and do the big yard cleanup. I'm probably part of the group that does the um, your summer pulse because I start thinking about this in June to do a fire safety kind of uh, preparation. So I think, uh, and when I do that, it's regularly, oh, I don't know, at least 10, 20 cubic yards. Uh, in fact, the, mm -hmm. one of those pictures is from my front yard on one of the earlier uh, uh, cleanups we did. And I really want to push that the, uh, the unscheduled is a lot more valuable to me because you, it's very difficult to schedule the, uh, the arborists or the, the tree uh, cleanup people on these you know, twice a year boundaries and to get them to show up a week before or two weeks before. First time I did that, I ended up with, I don't know, 20 yards of this stuff and it sat and it sat and it sat. And now I can call in and say, hey, I've got an enormous fuel load and it used to be green hiding up in the trees and now it's sitting on my driveway turning brown. Uh, so I think that part of the program is, is really excellent. That's my comment. Thank you for the comments. Okay, seeing no more. Oh, I have one, one more comment. Alan, you have the floor. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, I also am a regular participant of the program and appreciate the, the partnership that uh, I have with the district in terms of taking it away. A couple of suggestions on the, on the program. Um, I, su I suggest you keep track of the uh, number of customers and the number of repeat customers. You also mentioned about the GIS capabilities that the district has, and you can plot the, the, use, the customers who've used the service versus the customers that have not used the service. And that might uh, enable you to um, target, target your messages uh, to those who, uh, who haven't used the service in the, in the past and maybe are un, unaware of the services. I was confused by one thing about out of area. You said that there were people who were out of area. Um, I didn't think anyone was out of area since everybody um, was one of the six per participating areas. So maybe you could just ex explain that uh, to me. Thanks very much. Actually, uh, Jake, if I could ask you quickly, could uh, I was a little confused about that term myself. Could you specify what that means? Yes, I'm so sorry that I, as soon as I heard out of area, I was thinking, oh my goodness, that doesn't mean out of the jurisdiction. So out of area means that it's not the traditional area that the person lives in. Let's say the traditional area, well, let's see, what, what month are we in, uh, Irene, where uh, for October, that would be area? That would be area four. Four. So right now we're in area four. So let's say Jim Basiji lives in area two, that would be considered out of area. Two, three, one, five, six would be out of area to area four. Thank you very much. Yeah. Does that make sense, President Screen? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, uh, we will now move on to item 8B2, which is the Arastadero Evacuation Road Hardening Project. Uh, I think this is Programs Planning and Grants Manager Rendler presenting this report. Thank you. And here we are with um, another one of our uh, IHFR programs. We are in the process of planning work along Arrestadero Road. And you can see from our map, if you follow um, horizontally across the screen, the pink parcels and the green parcels border Arrestadero Road. 
and that's the area that we'd like to do our next home our next roadside hardening on sorry um this represents a regional partnership collaboration which is really exciting we have up to six um different jurisdictions that are being invited to participate here this is within the zone haven 005 zone so we've you know we're beginning to match things together and expand on all the collaborations that we're part of. It also touches our newest Firewise community, which you'll hear from more next month, but that's exciting to you know, start to connect the parcels and the neighborhoods and the evacuation route projects. Um, the one thing that we wanted to point out about this, um, when Denise and I spent a bunch of time and working on this for all of you is the district parcel is within this particular one down here and as many of you know across the street from our district parcel is a trailhead so this project is going to focus on our parcel and also making that those increasing the visibility of that trailhead where people are crossing the street bike, bikers are jumping on it's a very busy corner so it brings a benefit to the pedestrians and hikers on the trailhead and it also will reduce flashy fuels because a lot of people park off the street right there. So that's important at this late time in the fire season to keep those grasses down away from hot cars that would pull off the edge of the roadways there. We get the opportunity to continue our outreach and education. Um, it provides secondary egress for Page Mill Road, which is an evacuation route project that is um, has been done in the past and we're looking at refreshing the spring of next year. So we want to always emphasize two ways out. So this is creating that second way along Page Mill Road. And it also supports our infrastructure. The roadway continues underneath I-280. So we want to make sure that you know we're not affecting I-280. And there's also a water auxiliary tank up one of the side streets. So this will clean up the access through the intersection to that tank. We have any questions on the roadway on this upcoming project? Any comments from commissioners? I'll say this is a very complicated area. I'm very impressed that this is being done in November. It's not a, we must be getting, our, our setup time to do these must be getting faster. This is a very ambitious project in a short amount of time. I see uh, Commissioner Tyson has his hand up. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're, we just continue marching through the town area after area. And I know when we, we did our second major one on Moody Road, that was the first one where we had a lot of resident outreach because we wanted to see if we could expand beyond just the road right of way and get further further out there. And, and I know we had, it took a lot of, a little, a lot of time. It's, this, it's, it's a huge effort to make all this happen. And, and I got, I almost said corralled. I volunteered to help contact residents and actually it was kind of a fun activity. So I see those, or is that fuchsia, those pinkish, uh, things. If you need help contacting residents, just just let me know because I, I actually find I enjoy it. Wonderful, thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Seeing none, uh, are there any public comments on this item? Alan, you have a comment? Yes, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just curious as to how you decided to select as the, this is the next project. There's, many, many streets, many, many streets in town. Uh, this particular one, um, at least the section that goes under 280 and up to Page Mill um, doesn't have a, a very much uh, foliage. And my last part of the question is, are you going to go down Arastradero all the way to uh, Foothill, uh, Foothill Expressway? Um, thank you very much. Uh so you, uh, you, you, how far up Arrestado does this go? Does this go to the edge of this map or does it go beyond that? This particular phase goes from on the left side of the map where you see Berry Hill. That is the park and ride with those that eucalyptus grove in there. And then it continues under the freeway all the way up to the edge of our jurisdiction at Old Adobe Road. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, let's see, I guess we're moving on to item eight. C, uh, which is the Cal OES FEMA Hazardous Mitigation Grant Reports. Uh, this is also uh, Programs Planning Grant Manager Rendler's report. Could you please present that? 
Yes, thank you. So the update on our um, Cal OES FEMA hazardous mitigation sub-application, that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, this is our I-280 project. Between when I presented last and now, we had um, in July, we had one request for additional information. During um, July and August, when we hadn't met, we had six more come in. These ranged from questions about CEQA and when our timing for that would be done, inquiries about our treatment methods, as well as production and work schedule clarifications. All seven of our RFIs have been responded to and accepted by um, the Cal OES grant reviewers. So that's exciting news. We were able to answer everything they needed us to. Um, the next things that have happened is we are planning, the planning's proceeding. As you may remember from one of our other meetings, we hired an environmental firm, DUDEC, to help us with the environmental compliance for CEQA and also the visual impact assessment that Caltrans requires. The field visits were completed for the environmental compliance on September 12th, and the visual impact assessment field visits were completed on September 7th. And if Denise is still available, I know she was traveling and trying to chime in from her she, travels. She's not she on. Some no. anecdotes about our not anymore. Okay. So you will recall how warm it was on Labor Day weekend. And that was when Denise and the Dudek crew were out in the field, boots on the ground, you know, looking for species, doing botanical surveys, etc. It was very, very warm. Um, they did it. It was it was great. We needed to get that done because we're in we're in our final month for getting these requirements into the a grant application. The one big comment that Denise has brought forth several times is the amount of trash that they experienced while they were out there. It was three to five fold what we were expecting to find. So that's good information for us this early because we'll have to adapt to what we're going to do with that when we finally get to the operation stage. So the next thing that will happen between now and the next commission meeting is that we will receive the draft reports from DUDEC and review those before passing them on to Cal OES. Great, thank you. Any comments from uh, commissioners? Thank you so much. Any comments from the public on that? Seeing none, great. We will now move on to item nine. Thank you so much. I know it's, I, I, by the way, I really want to thank Denise for being out there. I talked to her about this as well. And she was out there in the worst of the heat, tromping along 280. Imagine what that was like. And she didn't complain at all. So that's the kind of staff we have. It's really impressive. Okay, um, item 9A is the approval of a license agreement for installation of acoustic hydrant caps on district-owned hydrants between the district and the Purisma Hills Water District. General Manager Logan, could you please present this report? Uh, yes, thank you. And I'm going to see if I can find my report, which I don't see. Um, <clears throat> Corey, can you help me project that report, please? Yeah, it's going to be, I didn't pull that up because I didn't realize you were doing really? oh, it. So hold on. <laughs> Sec. There we go. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so this report is um, about the license agreement, the installation of acoustic caps, and, the, and to review the terms and conditions of the license agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to give you some background on the, the partnership between Los Altos Hills County Fire District and Purisima Hills Water District, because that relationship is mentioned in the license agreement. In 1956, Purisima installed their water distribution system. And in 1956, Los Altos Hills County Fire District installed the district-owned hydrants to that Purisima Hills Water District distribution system. So as you recall from the strategic plan, uh, Parisma Hills is one of our structural partners because of the relationship of the water mains with the district owned water system that takes the water to the hydrant. Los Altos Hills owns approximately 552 hydrants. They're attached to 
Prisma Hills water distribution system and the 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 uh, Los Altos Hills County Fire District is responsible for keeping those hydrants in good shape. Now, the question is, what is a hydrant? Under the terms of the agreement, which is 1956 and 1980, the hydrant includes all connections, valves, pipes, and fittings. So we call that a pertinence to the hydrant that go into the main. That's a very important, um, uh, that's very important information. In 1980, Prisma Hills Water District and the County Board of Supervisors, acting on behalf of the district or the, water, the fire district, entered into an agreement to specify the rights and obligations of the parties consistent with the 1956 agreement. And then from 2013 to 2018, in response to the tragedies of the Oakland Hills Fire, Los Altos Hills County Fire District replaced district hydrants and the new hydrants were installed with the infrastructure, which included the water mains, tie-ins, valves, and related structure improvements, to re which include uh, water uh, retaining walls and asphalt. So basically the point of that is that all of our hydrants are fairly new from, 19, from 2013 to 2018, and all the infrastructure is new. That is really helpful when we look at what our maintenance obligations are, because that's all very new infrastructure. And that project, I think took a number of projects, but it was over a, maybe a three to four year period. The um, Los Altos Hills Hydrant Replacement Project benefited firefighter safety. It invested in vital fire system infrastructure and it benefited residents' um, life and property safety. So that's the background. Now let's move into talking about the terms and conditions of the agreement. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, September 15th of 22, which was very recently, discussions concluded with an oral agreement by the teams to the license agreement terms and conditions contingent on acceptance by certain parties. Uh, those parties were contacted and uh, were uh, accepting of the terms. On um, September 16th, 22, the final written license agreement was approved by the teams and approved as to form and legality by our lead deputy county council representing Los Altos Hills County Fire District. That's where we are at this point today. The license agreement primary terms and conditions include but are not limited to that Prisma Hills can install their acoustic caps on district owned hydrants. There's no cost to the fire district. Acoustic cap project will have no impact on the fire district, its agents, and reasonable and necessary use of the fire hydrants for the purposes set forth in the 1980 agreement. So that's a very important concept that was worked through in the negotiations. Uh, license agreement term is 20 years with two additional mutual 10-year options unless terminated earlier. Next slide, please. Either party may terminate the license agreement if the other party breaches its obligations. Prisma Hills shall defend, indemnify, and hold harmless the fire district and the listed parties. And Prisma Hills shall provide insurance as specified in the fire district insurance requirements exhibit B. So that's pretty much a synopsis of the agreement. And based upon that, I would like to recommend that the commission approve the license agreement between the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and Parisma Hills Water District for installation of acoustic hydrant caps on district owned fire hydrants. And uh, President Spreen, I'll turn it back to you if there's any questions from the commission. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Are there any clarifying questions from the commission? I'm seeing none. I'm actually fairly, uh, I've been through this multiple times during the negotiation, so I feel pretty confident with it. One of the things I brought up and just to mention for everybody is that, you know, Several times a year, someone runs into one of our hydrants. And once again, this will have no impact on our ability to go fix things, you know, in a critical, mission critical way that we've done in the past. So I felt very comfortable with that. Seeing no other commissioner questions, um, I will now entertain a motion. So moved, Commissioner Tonka. Thank you, a second? Warren seconds. Thank you, the item's now open for discussion. Any discussion from the commission? Seeing none, are there any public comments on this item? I see one hand up. Alan, you may have the floor. 
thanks so much. And I want to thank the commission for uh, uh, finally getting the ball across the goal line. This is a very important program. Uh, just in the last couple of days, there were two significant leaks, one on Lupine and one on La Loma Drive uh, that put residents uh, uh, out of service with water. So, uh, and I don't know the extent of the damage at this point. So these caps are important and will um, reduce the likelihood of that type of uh, accident occurring and certainly minimize expense. So thanks so much for making this happen. Thank you for those comments. And I want to say that uh, the people involved uh, really put a lot of time into it and, and you know, really appreciate the efforts that went into making this happen for, for, for everybody involved. Uh, let's see, no further discussion. I see no further hands. Um, we will vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Vasigi. You might, you might be muted. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you, everyone. We'll now move on to item 9B, approving the agreement with interstate grading and pavement for replacement of the district hydrant valve covers. Uh, district engineering consultant Tarantino, could you please present this report? I uh, sure can. Thank you, uh, President Spring. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, again, Jeff Tarantino with Fryer and Loretta. We are the uh, district consulting engineer um, supporting staff on uh, projects related to maintenance and replacement of the fire hydrant infrastructure. Um, the, the item before you tonight is for approving an, an agreement with interstate grading and paving, which has been previously selected and awarded an agreement um, by the town of Los Altos Hills for their annual uh, paving uh, program. Uh, interstate grading paving was selected through a publicly bid process. And um, as has been uh, consistent with prior year um, work, we have uh, negotiated an agreement with, um, with, the, with interstate. Um, this is also done with Person Hills Water District and Cal Water to um, raise district, in our case, the, the uh, hydrant valves that are owned uh, the, uh, by the district associated with our fire hydrants. Um, in our report, we identified that there are potentially between five and six uh, district-owned hydrant valves that may require ra uh, raising after the completion of a portion of the paving work. Um, the reason for the range is that uh, based on prior years experience, we know that ultimately the final paving limits are determined by the town's uh, construction inspector. And so we wanted to provide um, uh, you know, the, the, the range where, it'll, it, where there will be no more than six valves uh, likely impacted by the work, um, but there could be five. Um, one thing I did wanna note subsequent to our publishing of the report, um, we were alerted that one of the streets within um, the um, report, uh, Camino Hermoso, um, was right at the edge of actually, it's, it's actually within the Cal Water Service District. I did confirm with Personal Hills Water District earlier today that Camino Hermoso is um, just outside of their service district. So um, we have removed that item from interstate uh, grading and pavings work as it relates to the fire hydrant districts. Um, ultimately, once the, we have been notified by interstate grading paving that their work is complete, um, one of my team will perform a site inspection to determine the final quantity of uh, hydrogen valves that are impacted, and then we will um, uh, process a pay app um, related to, for the actual work completed. So at this time, I, I anticipate it'll be between four and five uh, valves, likely four, but um, we'll process that payment um, when the work has been satisfactory complete. All right. right. With that, I am ha happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Any clarifying questions from the commission? Seeing none, are there any additional, are there any, uh, actually hearing none, I, I will entertain a motion. Tyson will move. Thank you. Four and seconds. Thank you. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Not expecting any additional things, seeing nothing. Any public comments on this item? Seeing none, we will uh, now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Basigi. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you so much. We'll move on to item 10. 
Uh, items 10A and B are the fiscal year 2023-24 budget development memo report and the appointment of a standing budget subcommittee for fiscal year 2023-24 that shall be subject to the Brown Act. Financial consultant Vargas, please present these items. I'm shuffling papers like a mad woman, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so first I'm gonna talk about uh, 10A, um, which is um, the memorandum report you received in your packet. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, memorandum report provides a background on our budget development pro process. Um, so it is that time of year again, uh, you know, we are required by the uh, Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors to prepare a uh, budget showing expected uh, revenues and expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year. That is going to be July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. Um, and I do provide kind of a timeline. Uh, this is based on last year's uh, budget uh, preparation. So I'm jumping ahead of myself. <laughs> we formed a uh, standing budget subcommittee. Now this is a uh, subcommittee that is subject to the Brown Act. Um, it, it would have public meetings um, that the public is invited to attend. And last year, um, we um, I, I, I was very pleased with the, the outcome from last year. So this year I'm proposing that, you know, at, at this meeting tonight, uh, that the commission appoint uh, standing budget subcommittee. Hopefully uh, that would be less than a quorum. So uh, two or three is ideal. Um, and then, um, in either October or November, there will be a public meeting of the budget subcommittee where we will discuss and develop a draft budget, which we will return to uh, the regular commission meeting on November 15th. And at that point, the whole commission will review and discuss the uh, draft, make changes as needed. Um, we want to, of course, stay strategically consistent with our district's missions and goals by uh, involving as many eyes as possible. And um, after, uh, so after the uh, November meeting, so between November 15th and between the January 17th, 2023 meeting, the budget committee can hold another meeting if needed, uh, usually not needed because the only changes between there come from County Office of Budget Analysis. We'll be receiving our revenues uh, projection. So um, hopefully we have all of our expenditures uh, kind of tied together by uh, the November meeting. Um, but if needed, it's an option. Um, and then finally on the regular commission meeting of January 17th, uh, again, we will bring a revised draft to the board of commissioners uh, and the board of commissioners will give direction to staff and uh, to incorporate any additional changes into a final draft, which will be submitted to the office of budget and analysis before their February 3rd 2023 deadline. So what I am asking at tonight's meeting, or I guess recommending, is uh, that the uh, fire, the commission uh, put together a standing budget subcommittee, and uh, hopefully uh, there will be some volunteers this year. And it gives you a chance to stand right now and stretch. So if you would like to stand up and volunteer, you're more than welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you uh, any clarifying questions for or discussion commission about this at all? Okay, uh, the focus of the standing budget committee will be limited to review of the fiscal year 2023-24 budget, just the specific year. Um, as a standing subcommittee, it will be subject to the meeting rules required in the Brown Act and will be made up of less than a quorum of the commission, which is three or fewer members. Uh, if the commission is amenable to the creation of the standing subcommittee, I would now accept volunteers for said committee. I will add also that I've been involved in this committee for the past number of years and Every year we've tried to make it more comprehensive, more transparent and more strategic than the year before. Uh, and I think it's really tried to go along with the growth of this, of this district. So uh, it's an important function. So I will now accept volunteers for said subcommittee. Raise your hands or stand up, anyone else? I know, I know we have very active subcommittees going on right now with strategic plan, which really sort of over, you know, which overlaps this as well as we have two uh, very busy council members from the town. So we have a limited number of people involved with this. And of course we have two uh, commissioners not here today. I'm willing to step forward to the said, said subcommittee, um, which is sufficient by the way, we only need one. 
but that we would also, I guess, be allowed to see if uh, I wouldn't volunteer. If it helps with the volunteer process for I would them, out, um, staff does most of the development of this. Right. So I think uh, your actual hours spent, it really is hours per month, perhaps. So it's it's not a huge burden on your time. And, the other thing is it's, and this would allow for next month, if I guess if either Joan or Melvin wanted to join, we would allow them to, uh, we could we could discuss that next month as well. But uh, seeing everyone else getting busy, um, I'm willing to proceed with that. With that, I would need a motion from commission to create the standing budget subcommittee for fiscal year 2023-24, subject to the Brown Act with me, Commissioner Spreen, serving. Any motion or second? Warren moves. Where are you on the bus, Roger? Mm -hmm. Anyone else want a second? Tanka seconds. Thank you. The item is now open for discussion. Any further discussion from the commission on this? Seeing none, any public discussion on this? Seeing none, we will now vote on the creation of the Standing Budget Subcommittee with myself, Commissioner Spreen, serving. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Oh, look, there, there's a typo on the, the script. <laughs> President Spreen. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, there was a typo. Wow, we have mm -hmm. Mr. Kearney on the script. Look at that. All right. <laughs> so, uh, you go back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Basiti. <laughs> Commissioner Basiti. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. And Commissioner Warren. Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two X. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, let's see. We'll now go on to item 10C, the report on the draft fiscal year 2021 20, to 22 financial audit report. Uh, and direction to staff to submit necessary documentation to the county subject to final approval by the commission. Financial consultant Vargas, could you present this report? Just to keep you busy. Exactly, uh, yeah, I'm like shuffling between, okay. So this is just um, a progress report for you on um, the year just ended uh, financial audit. And um, again, we are um, required to have an annual financial audit. Um, you'll recall at the last meeting, we uh, approved or you approved in a professional services agreement with uh, Vector and Company. And uh, between then and today, uh, they have been working with uh, district staff uh, to review, um, review and do field work for the preliminary draft. Um, they are also coordinating with our prior auditing firm, which was Ide Bailey, uh, to collect work papers from them and records. And um, the preliminary audit draft is now in progress. So after today's meeting and between October 7th, uh, district staff will continue to work with Fector to prepare a preliminary draft for submittal to the controller treasurer department uh, by their due date of October 7th. Um, so October 18th, the commission will receive the preliminary draft after review and discussion. Any revisions will be incorporated into a commission approved final draft. And that is submitted then to the controller treasurer department by um, October 19th. So um, mm -hmm. then after, uh, after that final submittal, uh, there will be um, a clean copy, quote unquote, final financial audit for you to formally approve uh, for publication on, at the November 15th meeting. And uh, it's no action required, this is just a uh, <laughs> Thank you, financial consultant Vargas. Any discussion from the commission? Not expecting any. Uh, any public comment on this item? Thank you, seeing none. We will move on to item 11, personnel updates. Uh, General Manager Logan, could you please, please present item 11A, which is the memorandum report that covers items 11 B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, yes, thank you, Board President Spring. Uh, this will be a little bit of a elongated um, uh, presentation by myself because we have a number of actions here taking place. So please bear with me. Uh, attached in the agenda packet is a memorandum report that recommends the commission approve personnel actions that will align district personnel with the adopted fiscal year 2022-23 budget 
of the county and special districts under the supervision and control of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners. Currently, for fiscal year 22-23, the district has 5.5 FTE, that's full-time equivalent positions, um, budgeted and approved, and has filled four FTE positions. Approving the recommendation will fill 0.5 FTE, which is the technical analyst and project manager, and then the full-time operations manager remains vacant. The emergency, the emergency services manager position becomes full-time, and Victoria Beebe, who's currently the full-time general analyst, will fill the emergency services manager position. Captain Denise Gluen, who is the current part-time emergency services manager, will remain part-time and move to the role of community education and risk reduction manager. So that's just a summary of what is in the memorandum uh, on uh, item 11A. The memo report outlines each of the positions recommended to be filled and provides qualifications of the persons who have agreed to accept these positions if they are so approved by the Board of Commissioners. To summarize, um, you all know Victoria Beebe, the wonderful work she's done for us, and she completed a rigorous requirement of certification by the Governor's Office of Emergency Service and was awarded the Emergency Manager Specialist Certification. This certification represents more than 150 hours of study committed to topics that include hazardous mitigation planning, emergency operations planning, emergency disaster response, and disaster recovery operations. In addition, Ms. Beebe is a career, has a career as an EMT and EMT certifications. These are all listed on her VITA with the employment agreement and the position descriptions that are in your agenda packet. Captain Denise, Denise Gluen, retired fire, fire captain, will continue in her role in community education and formally move into risk reduction management duties, which really she's already performing for the district. She will utilize her deep knowledge, passion for life safety, skills and training in wildfire and evacuation. Captain Gluen will locate vulnerable areas for evacuation road hardening and vegetation mitigation. She will lead the ground, truth, ground truthing activities and inspections of the terrain within the, with the district team, scope the related fire and disaster hazards, work alongside the team, and advise the fuel reduction crews during the evacuation road construction, and collaborate with consultants for field measurements and metrics, which will be utilized to evaluate projects for continuous improvement. The opportunity for community education and management of risk reduction activities and projects aimed at reducing wildfire in the, in the impacts of disaster are an excellent use of Captain Gluen's highly trained skills and leverage her contributions as the visionary member of the district team. Moving on, the next position is a new position, a part-time technical analyst project manager. Fire Captain Ryan Cronin, retired will fill a wide gap by providing services as a technical analyst and project manager with a focus on supporting the projects and the teams during evacuation route design, development, planning, and implementation. This is a unique opportunity re to retain Captain Cronin, who can provide these skills with the deep skills of a firefighter, a fire captain, police, code, and fire arson officer, and a skillful speaker and instructor not to mention his background in technology, analytics, and data analysis. This is a very key position between planning projects and implementation of projects through solid project management and technical analysts. The next uh, temporary part-time position being recommended to be filled serves to March 31st of 2023. And this new position is a temporary part-time events coordinator and FireWise coach. Los Altos Hills County Fire District continues to increase services to the community. Marjorie Klein is a specialist, specialized expert in event planning and has coupled that with ex expertise in building community connection related to wildfire events and education. She provides ex expertise as a FireWise coach. This was a need identified during the organization of Saddle Mountain Neighborhood 
that experience the rigors of, of FireWise USA certification. There are other Los Altos Hills County Fire District neighborhoods seeking FireWise status and need support from the district. The team is excited to explore these opportunities with Ms. Klein. A, the last new position is a temporary part-time budget manager. This position fills a gap as we move into a, the more complex regional projects, expand services and personnel, and prepare for the rigors of financial requirements of an ambition, ambitious Cal OES FEMA grant application. The load on the financial services has grown exponentially. Currently, the district contracts for, an account, for accounting services for payroll, invoice processing, and financial records. We do not have a budget or finance manager. Four tasks are now at hand. Uh, collaboration with the new financial auditors to meet the upcoming county deadlines, which are fast approaching on us. Analysis of the current financial district practices, records, financial software to scale as we move into grant and regional projects. Collaboration with the appointment standing budget subcommittee activities that require budget reports and planning for FY23-24 and may include funding to remodel El Monte Fire Station and use of the district parcel. These are all complicated budget matters. It is clear that a gap exists and cannot be addressed by the current service levels. Hence, the district is most grateful that Russell Morale is available and able to provide his vast experience and qualifications as a CPA and a government financial executive to Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The position description and Mr. Morales' resume convey the depth of the services he will, he will render. In addition, Mr. Morales has broad experience in financial strategic planning and will be instrumental in assessing, analyzing, and providing reports, issues, and options to the Board of Commissioners related to financial strategic roadmap. It will be most helpful as we work with County Office of Budget Analysis, OBA, to formulate the upcoming budget and create a budget narrative guided by a financial strategic plan. So that is my report, President Spring, on uh, item 11A. Now I'm moving to item 11B, C, D, E, and F. May I proceed? Yes, please. Yes. So those items um, are to discuss and take possible action to approve at well positions between the district and the persons named in each agenda item. Item 11B is a full time at will emergency services manager. Item 11C is a part time at will community education and risk reduction manager. Item D, part time at will technical analyst project manager. Item 11E, temporary part time events coordinator and firewise coach. And item 11F, temporary part-time budget manager. The proposed employment agreements and position descriptions are included in the District Board of Commissioners agenda material for these items, along with the um, applicant's uh, VITA or resume. California Government Code Section 54953, subsection C, subsection three, requires the commission to orally report a summary of proposed compensation before taking final action to adopt that compensation here by approving the employment agreement. Key components of the proposed compensation are described in detail in the proposed employment agreement, including in the materials for this agenda item. I will now summarize personnel item 11B, emergency services manager. The proposed at will full-time employment contract includes an effective work start date and compensation date of October 1st, 2022, and includes the following compensation. Wages. The proposed contract sets the pay rate at $76 an hour. Benefits. Under the proposed agreement, the position will receive certain benefits, including vacation accrual of 15 days per year with a maximum of accrual at any one time of 120 hours, which is 15 days. Sick leave of 24 hours per year. Sick leave can be accrued to a maximum of 72 hours. No cash out of sick leave on termination. 
vehicle stipend of $250 per month, uniform allowance of up to $2,800 during the first year of employment for specific items identified in the proposed employment contract. And the proposed employment agreement does provide holiday pay, does not provide medical benefits or retirement benefits. District will provide laptop and supportive equipment necessary for performance of duties. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Um, oh, as you can see, this is going to be an item that's going to have a sort of repetitive style to it to, to, since we have to work through each individual employment contract and we're required by law to uh, summarize these things orally. Uh, before I open it for any questions from the commission, I just want to make a blanket statement, which is to say that um, I think anyone who looks at us as a district recognizes the incredible quality of staff we have. And I just want to say also, um, I ne never cease to be amazed at the uh, credibility and quality of the people that Jay has attracted to us. Um, and it's just stunning. So uh, I want to thank everybody involved here tonight. But once again, we're going to take each of these one at a time. This is 11B. Um, are there any clarifying questions from the commission on 11B? Seeing none, um, I will now entertain a motion for item 11B, the employment agreement with Victoria Beebe for emergency services manager. Warren moves. I see you seconds. Thank you so much. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Seeing none, is there any public comment on this item? Uh, seeing none, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to item 11C, which is the employment agreement with Denise Gluhan. Roger, Jim's got his hand up. Oh. I, I like you make Please. A, I like to make a final comment about 11B. Please. In addition to this commission position, I am also a member of the uh, Los Altos Hills Emergency Preparedness Committee, uh, for which Victoria Beebe is an associate member. And I think with her new job as emergency services manager, she'll be amazingly effective in cross leveraging the, the program of our town with the program of the, uh, the fire district and also any, uh, any possible, um, any possible, you know, effective to joint effort that we could possibly have together. So I really welcome this. Thank you so much. Appreciate those, those kind words. Yeah. Um, moving on to item. Oh, Mayor Tyson. You know, I don't, wasn't quite sure how to do this because uh, because I, I saw Jim jump in on this, and I want to just say how pleased I am with the work I've seen for, with big, both Victoria and Denise, whom we haven't gotten to yet. And just to say, also, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna share your reaction, Roger, to see how does how does General Manager Logan do it. Every other organization I'm involved with is having trouble with turnover and finding people and qualified. And, and she seems to find folks. I read through the resumes of Ryan and Marjorie and Russell, and we haven't spoken about them yet. And I know we will, but, but they are immensely qualified people. How does she do it? I don't know, but don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much for those comments. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move on to item 11C. Uh, the employment agreement with Denise Gluen for Community Education and Risk Reduction Manager. General Manager Logan, please present this item. Yes, thank you. I will now summarize pers personnel item 11C, uh, the Community Education and Risk Reduction Manager. The proposed at-will part-time employment contract includes an effective work start date and compensation date of October 1st, 2022, and includes the following compensation. Wages. The proposed contract sets the rate of pay at $89 per hour. Base compensation shall not exceed $111,072 on an annual basis without written approval of the GM and notification to the president of the Board of Commissioners. Benefits. Under the proposed agreement, the position will receive certain benefits, including sick leave of 24 hours per year, subject to a maximum of 48 hours accrual cap, no sick leave payout on termination, a vehicle stipend of $150 per month, uniform allowance of up to 500 
$1,500 per first year of employment for specific items identified in the proposed employment contract. And the proposed agreement, employment agreement does not provide vacation, holiday pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. District provides a laptop and supportive equipment necessary for performance of duties. End of report, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any clarifying questions or comments? Uh, okay, let's see. Um, let's see, I guess uh, I will now entertain a motion for this item, the employment agreement with Denise Gluhan. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So move, Tonka. Thank you. Second, Warren. Thank you, sir. Uh, the item is now open for discussion. Any discussion from the commission? Any public comments on this item? Seeing none, we'll now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 11D, uh, the employment agreement with Ryan Cronin for Technical Analyst Project Manager. General Manager Logan, please present this item. Yes, the proposed at-will part-time employment contract includes an effective work start date and compensation start date of September 20th, 2022, and includes the following compensation. Wages. The proposed contract sets the rate of pay at $80 per hour. Base compensation shall not exceed $84,480 on an annual basis without written approval of the general manager and notification to the president of the board of commissioners. Benefits. Under the proposed agreement, the position will receive certain benefits, including sick leave of 24 hours after 120 days of service, a uniform allowance of up to $2,000 during the first year of employment for specific items identified in the proposed employment contract, and a vehicle stipend of $150 per month. The proposed Employment agreement does not provide vacation, holiday pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. The district will provide supportive equipment necessary for performance of duties. Thank you, end of report. Thank you, any clarifying questions? I will now entertain a motion for item 11D for this employment agreement with Ryan Cronin. Warren moves. In best 80 seconds. Thank you. Uh, the item is now open for discussion. Any discussion? The commission, no, any public item, any public comments on this item? Seeing none, uh, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call. President Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Basigi. Yes. Commissioner Tonka. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Great, thank you. And uh, Captain Cronin, now that we've accept, now that we've agreed, I'm happy to welcome you. And I know there's a lot of excitement having you on board. And uh, we've got a lot of fun things going on. And we're really, really excited to have you with us. Thank you. President and commissioners, thank you very much. I look forward to working with you. OK, welcome. well, now we will now move on to item 11E, the employment agreement with Marjorie Klein for events coordinator and Firewise coach. General Manager Logan, please present this item. Yes, the proposed at-will part-time employment contract includes an effective work start date and compensation date of October 1st, 2022, and includes the following compensation. Wages. The proposed contract sets the rate of pay at $50 per hour with total compensation not to exceed $25,000 during the six-month term. Benefits. Under the proposed agreement, the position will receive certain benefits, including sick leave of 24 hours, after 120 days of service. The proposed employment agreement does not provide mileage stipend, uniform allowance, vacation, holiday pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. District will provide supportive equipment necessary for performance of duties. Uh, thank you, end of report. Thank you. Uh, any clarifying questions? Okay, I'll entertain a motion for item 11E, the employment agreement with Marjorie Klein. Warren moves. Second. Bar Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, any let's see any discussion? Uh, we're open for discussion. Any comment? Any discussion by commissions? No. Uh, any public comments on this item? 
Seeing none, uh, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. President Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. And the motion passes five to zero with two absent. Thank you so much. And thank you, Marjorie, for joining us. I know that uh, working with the residents is the most important thing you can do. So we're really happy to have you encouraging more of, this, more of these, these projects with our neighbors. Thank you. Okay, item 11F, the agreement with Russell Morale. Am I saying that correctly? I hope I'm Morale. Yeah. Um, for budget manager, General Manager Logan, please present this item. The proposed at will part time employment contract includes the effective work start date and compensation start date of September 20th, 2022, and includes the following compensation wages. The proposed contract sets the rate of pay of $105 per hour with a total compensation not to exceed $50,400 for the employment term of six months and 10 days. Benefits, under the proposed agreement, the position will receive certain benefits, including sick leave of 24 hours after 120 days of service. The proposed agreement does not provide mileage stipend, uniform allowance, vacation, holiday pay, medical benefits, or retirement benefits. District will provide a laptop and supportive equipment necessary for performance of duties. Thank you, end of the personnel report. Thank you, uh, any questions from the commission? I will entertain a motion for item 11F, the employment agreement with Russell Morale for budget manager. Warren moves. Thank you. Procedure second. Thank you, sir. The item is now open for discussion. Any discussion from the commission? I will say that as a, a member of the Standing Budget Committee, I'm actually really excited to be working with Russell. When I see his background, uh, I intend to be learning something as well. So I'm, I'm quite eager and excited to have this occur. Um, let's see, uh, any public comments on this item? I see Alan has his hand up. Alan, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. It's wait. Um, I should say that I've worked with Mr. Morelli and he's certainly well qualified. But I believe a fifty thousand dollar, four hundred and eighty hour uh, budget manager is an unwarranted and unreasonable expenditure for the accounting work needed by the district. The district's extremely small. It's a simple organization with only sixty five budget line items, and many amounts provided by the county or set by contract or staffing uh, contracts. Just five and five employees and roughly forty contractor slash vendors. For many years, the district accountant has paid the bills, prepared the monthly financial statement, prepared the budget and narrative, and supported the audit for less than $40,000 per year. The district budget narrative is only 28 pages and highly repetitive year to year. The budget schedule submitted to the county is one and a half pages. The commission has shown that the budget accuracy is really not a concern. Over the last four years, the district had a cumulative variance of over $19 million in net income. Financial performance is rarely discussed and huge variances have made no difference. Budget managers may be found in large cities and agencies, but not in small ones. Neither the fire department or the town of Los Altos Hills have budget managers and both are substantially larger and more complex organizations. The district's budgeting variances are unrelated to accounting but are due instead to the absence of comprehensive plans with specific goals, detailed tasks, and schedules, compounded by a lack of performance measures and timely execution and excessive contingencies. A budget is a detailed operating plan and not a page of numbers. Department heads and management need to prepare the plan. Accountants simply keep score. My recommendation, the district should continue to have the accountant prepare the budget for management and commission direction, Ms. Vargas has done an excellent job in compiling and reporting the figures and has schedules in place to minimize the effort. If more accounting guidance is needed, the district should contract with Mr. Morelli, but for a maximum of 100 hours or less. Thank you so much. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, uh, we will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, can you conduct the roll call? Yes. President Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Basigi? Yes. Commissioner Tonka? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Okay, and the motion passes five to zero with two absent.
Great, thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to item 12, uh, commission member reports. Um, let's see, um, item 12A is the future agenda items. This is an opportunity for commissioners to provide reports or any future agenda topics. Are there any comments from the commission? I know it's been a long night already. I think most things have been discussed. Seeing nothing, thank you. Uh, any public comment on this item? I, there's really nothing to comment on. Uh, let's move to item 12B. Uh, the next regular commission meeting, uh, this is a notice that the next regular commission meeting will take place October 18th, 2022. Uh, any comments from the commission on this scheduled meeting? Seeing none, any public comments on this next scheduled meeting? Seeing none, we will now move on to item 13, adjournment. Uh, this concludes the September 20th, 2022 regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. This meeting is adjourned at 9.32 p.m. Uh, as discussed, the next regular meeting will take place via Zoom on October 18th, 2022 at 7 p.m. District Clerk Vargas, please stop the recording. <laughs>